Alright, so um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Good morning or good afternoon or even good night everyone uh, So it's been a pleasure to uh, have met you again through the video So in this video I'm going to continue uh, the uh, discussion the discussion about how human would form impression on others uh, on the perspective from the perspective of social psychology so last week you have learned uh, about uh, two models yeah two models that explain uh, in, a, in a very simple way how human form their, uh, their impression which are the um, configure configure model by Solomon Ask and the other one the cognitive algebra by Anderson and uh, and now in this video uh, I'm going to move further a little bit further by by discussing about a bit more complex process in human cognition involving how uh, people form their impression on others so in a very uh, simple way yeah uh, to describe how people uh, process information yeah, including how we process uh, social information which is uh, information about other people in and in, in, in a context of so uh, social situation there are several stages that are often we need to go through uh, that and it describes how we process and we use information yeah, those information so here is the illustration how the process works yeah and it was firstly mentioned by a social psychologist named John Barr. And this is where uh, the, the journey starts when an actor or individual, an individual uh, perceives a stimuli, here, stimuli here. And then uh, in the first process, we unconsciously uh, scan the environment, yes, yeah, scan the environment and going through all the information unconsciously and we try to seek uh, uh, any stimuli that catches our at attention yeah so basically this is the uh, stages where we try to uh, we try to seek uh, more information whether we should put more attention to a very specific stimuli yeah so it's a largely uh, unconscious process in the pre-attentive analysis yeah but then we try to when we uh, when a certain stimuli catches our attention then the next process would be called focal attention which means this is where we put more attention to uh, to certain stimuli that catches our that capture our attention yeah and we hope to uh, uh, process more this information by categorizing them into our memories and this is where uh, where you learned about a social schemas yeah so we try before we uh, put meanings yeah, to information we first uh, try to categorize them uh, so it makes it uh, simpler so we make it even simpler for those information yeah we make it simpler for ourselves to, to put meanings or to interpret those information yeah and this is where uh, we uh, go on to the next stage that is comprehension so we try to put meanings to those information yeah and it's largely conscious yeah conscious processes because we try to interpret yeah interpret those stimuli that catch that captures uh, our attention and then the, the last process would be elaborative reasoning this is where we try to connect uh, all meaningful information in our cognition yeah so after we put meanings to certain information we try to uh, seek connection between this information, the newly captured information, with our uh, stored information, the earlier stored information, and we try to put a more complex meaning by associating them uh, by put uh, by putting association between those informations. So this is the um, a very simple way to describe how uh, a stimuli, yeah, stimuli, how we start with. Uh, capturing certain stimuli and categorizing them into certain uh, into certain categories of course but then we put meanings to it and then we try to form a more complex uh, more complex meaning by uh, by seeing or or forming an association between uh, between 
several meaningful informations. Yeah, not only the newly captured information, but also uh, existing information, ex existing meaningful information that uh, we have stored in our cognition. Yeah, and the questions uh, would remain: uh, How then our cognition decides uh, which uh, stimulus, which which stimulus or stimuli that uh, capture more attention and then then uh, that are worthy enough uh, to uh, to capture our attention so basically there are three uh, three uh, specific categories uh, in which uh, certain stimuli that we use to to decide whether uh, those stimuli could be worth our attention yeah so the first cat characteristics that we are interested in is the salience of the information, whether those stimuli or those information is important uh, relative to other stimuli, of course. So we try to compare uh, several stimuli that is available, that are available in our, uh, in our, uh, that are available in our, in our senses, yeah, that can be catched and that, that can be caught by our senses. But then, yeah, by deciding which stimuli worth our attention, then it depends on the first characteristic, that is, we try to compare them. And if those information is important relative to other stimuli, then it would be, uh, it would guarantee uh, more deeper or deeper attention from, uh, from us. Yeah, so the first characteristics is salience. And the second would be vividness, which concerns on the quality of the stimuli itself that makes it worth of our attention yeah and the last one would be the accessibility whether those information uh, is accessible whether it is easily accessible or uh, it is hardly accessible in our cognition uh, but the basic would be but the basic idea is that any information that is easily accessible would be easier to recall so i think this is a very common sense common sense yeah whether uh, some information uh, could be easily accessible then it would be uh, used more often yeah than those information that is not readily accessible so the first um category that we that we are interested in uh, to determine whether uh, whether certain stimuli worth uh, worth of our uh, worth our attention is that whether it's salient compared to other stimuli? So the uh, the, the 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 emphasis, but the the main point here is that we try to compare those information or those stimuli with uh, with each other, and uh, those that are stand out, those who stood uh, who stood out, that is stood out, then it would guarantee our attention even more. And a stimuli, yeah, stimuli could be salient because of several reasons yeah so the first one because it is novel so imagine when you see a pregnant woman yeah it's quite salient because compared to other stimuli the normal people it's different it's new it's new information uh taking uh taking count of their body size and also the body shapes of course of course that uh, that stimulus or the, the a pregnant woman would a guarantee our attention even more than the regular people or when the stimuli uh, for example a person he wears a unique uh, a, a unique outfit would uh, i would say when someone wears a hot pink trousers yeah, it would easily catch our attention because that is different yeah because those who choose to who opt for using a pink trouser out of nowhere would uh, easily captured would, would be easily captured by our by our attention because that is extremely different it is new compared to other regular people with their normal clothes yeah and also uh, a, a, a stimulus could be uh, different yeah could be uh, could be captured easily yeah by our attention because it is different compared to our prior expectation so for example if you if you see someone if you see a child a very little child cursing a very bad words for example and then you would be surprised because how come a child could be 
um, fluently wears a very bad curse words because that's something that uh, not uh, that, that that doesn't happen every day. This is something that is completely different from our expectation. So this also guarantees uh, uh, guarantees our attention. Yeah. Another characteristics that is related to how a stimulus could as a stimulus or stimuli could uh, could be captured easily by your attention. It, it is because maybe it is important uh, to to your goals. So, for example, if you see someone and if you see uh, someone who is extremely attractive physically, then it would easily catch, uh, capture, uh, it, will, it would be easily captured by your, by your attention because uh, those guys <laughs> who is physically attractive, you could see them as a potential mating partner. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is important to your goal because uh, your goal is that you want to have a boyfriend or a partner that is who is who is physically attractive yeah because though that is important for your goal then you pay more attention to it or even because something or the stimuli the stimuli itself dominating your visual field so imagine when you cross a road and you see a, a huge advertising yeah in the in on the road yeah and then it's really hard uh, to, uh, it's really hard not to pay attention to the uh, to to that ad, especially the political ad, the dodgy political ad uh, that contains an image of a politicians that you don't like, for example. Then it would extremely hard to not not to pay attention to it because it dominates your visual field. Yeah. Or the last one would be because you are instructed to pay attention. Yeah. So. When I, as I lecture, as a lecturer, of course, I demand you to pay attention to the video, to the lecture video, so that you could uh, you could complete your weekly uh, weekly assignment. Yeah. So when you are instructed to pay attention to all the all video lectures, then of course you would pay attention. Yeah. So this is actually so this is how. Yeah. So the those are uh, those are all the antecedents. Uh, why uh, certain stimuli could be seen as salient compared to other uh, stimuli available. And the consequences, what are the consequences uh, seeing certain stimuli as more salient to others? Uh, we could see those stimuli as more influential to our behavior. Yeah, of course, um, a huge political ad that is available on the, side, uh, on the sidewalk, for example, it would it would capture your attention quite easily, but when you see it as very influential, that could be a dangerous. Yeah, could be dangerous for you, especially when you are driving. It will it would it will distract your attention, and then it could be lethal. Yeah, it could lead to a traffic accident, and of course uh, the behavior that reflects uh, uh, that reflects uh, uh, from the perception, it could be seen as disposition as well. Yeah, it could be. Uh, when you see uh, a stimuli, when you see stimuli that uh, that are salient compared to others, then it could form, it could entice a behavior, yeah, a behavior that represents your response to that stimuli, yeah. So your behavior it could be easily formed, it could be easily manifested through a behavior when you see a very salient stimuli, yeah. And of course, uh, the behavior could be uninfluenced by situation. So it could be influenced. It, it is mostly influenced by the stimuli itself, not by the situation. Yeah. So you judge. Uh, so you attribute your behavior. Yeah. You, you, you try to explain your behavior as the consequences of as a consequences of seeing a stimuli that is salient. Yeah. I think this is ex this is something that is quite uh, common sense as well. Yeah. So, for example, um, when you uh, when you are driving, yeah, when you are driving on the road, and then you see a huge political ad showing a picture of politicians that you don't like, that it leads you to a traffic to a traffic accident. Then it could be uh, we could see and uh, we could explain those behavior, your careless driving, by blaming those uh, by uh, blaming those distracting ad instead of seeing it as a product of a situation yeah it's, a, it's rather than a product of of the uh, of the situation of the driving itself so we could see we could say that if someone 
is distracted by a huge political ad. We could see that the, the careless driving or the behavior of carelessly driving their car or driving their motorcycle would be a direct result of, of a response, yeah, of response of seeing those stimuli. So it is uh, hardly influenced by the situation itself. And then other consequence that might arise is that uh, we tend to evaluate those stimuli more extreme than the usual. So for example, if you see a child who curse a bad words, then you would evaluate uh, those, that child uh, in, a, in a quite extreme way. Then you would wonder what kind of parents, yeah, what kind of parents that educate their child to be, a, to be someone who curse a lot, yeah? But then after that, after you see second ups, after you see a second child or the third child that shows the, the, the exact same behavior, your evaluation might be lesser, uh, maybe less extreme, yeah, to the second or to the third observation compared to the first observation. And this is something that we call the regression to the mean. Yeah, and we're going to discuss this more deeply later. And yeah, and we tend to see the second and the third or the fourth or the next observation as more usual and less extreme than the first occurrence of that behavior. And of course, uh, seeing uh, a salient uh, stimulus could uh, lead to coherent impression, coherent impression of those people. Yeah. So when we see a very salient, uh, very salient uh, stimuli, a stimuli like uh, someone who wears a very odd out outfits, something like, like uh, hot pink trousers or hot, hot pink trousers and green and green um, green uh, green t-shirts for example <laughs> then you would see this person as as not having uh, not having a good taste of fashion for example then you would see a very coherent impression of someone who don't have a good sense of a good a good sense of fashion then it helps us yeah by uh, by having uh, salient stimuli it would help us to form a more coherent impression towards other and the second characteristics yeah that leads to uh, that leads to a uh, guarantee, uh, guarantee leads to a guarantee that we're going to pay more attention to certain stimuli is vividness yeah and it concerns on the quality of the stimuli itself so we're not trying to compare it with other stimuli available not other available stimuli yeah um so basically vividness means whether the stimuli itself has an intense quality yeah intense quality that guarantee our attention yeah for example uh, something that is emotionally emotionally evoking yeah em emotionally evoking something like a school shooting case it's not it does not happen every day and of course this is something that is quite shocking and uh, and very emotional as well and if it is completed with it is completed with a concrete or image provoking for example if you see a footage of a school shooter uh, shooting the, the the pupils or the students of a schools, for example, then you would, and also you when you see the the blood spills everywhere and the screaming and also the running and stuff, it would be extremely <laughs> emotional to see that. And of course, those uh, stimuli is hard to ignore. Yeah, it's extremely hard to ignore. And when the stimuli itself is closely relevant to you. For example, the school shooting that happened in a school that uh, that is only three hundred meters from your from your uh, from where you live, then you it would be frightening, <laughs> yeah, very in, uh, intense because it happens in a very close distance to yourself. But when it happened in somewhere like in the USA, for example, it might be still uh, vivid, yeah, the stimuli itself. But not it's but it's not as scary as when it, it when it happens uh, very close to uh, to our uh, to our home or to our residence. Then, yeah, of course, uh, the combination of those three 
makes it even harder for us to, uh, to, to ignore the stimuli. And the last uh, part and the last uh, characteristics that guarantee our attention is accessibility, which means we pay more attention to a stimuli that is more accessible to others. So this leads to a very uh, popular uh, social psychology uh, concepts that we call the priming effect. Yeah. So the priming effect basically means uh, that we uh, tend to pay more attention yeah, to those stimuli. Uh, we, we tend to uh, give a, a provide a certain stimuli uh, based on uh, existing stimuli that are available. So this is a very simple example about the priming effect. Yeah. So suppose that I gave, I give uh, two different individuals, uh, two different sets of words. So the first individuals, I gave, I give them uh, bread, juice, and milk, and I, I, and I ask them to guess what word is this. Yeah, what, what uh, the the fourth word, what the fourth word is, and the second person, the second individual, will be given the completely different sets of words. Yeah, and those words would be towel, shower, and shampoo, but the, 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 say, uh, the similarity between those two individuals, even though they were given, they are given uh, completely two different sets of words, they still need to guess, yeah, they still need to guess the, the similar, the similar word, yeah, I mean, the Q itself is quite similar, so it's S, O, something, and P, yeah, and uh, quite interestingly, those two uh, those two individuals would give you completely different answer, even though they uh, they they have to uh, even though they have to uh, guess basically the same word. Yeah. So the first individual will will tend to give uh, soup as their answer because the the existing words yeah the existing or the stimulus words uh, are all about food. Yeah. And the second individual will tend to give uh, answer uh, uh, soap as their answer. And what happens if, well, basically those two words is exactly the right answer because there's no wrong answers here. But the idea is it, uh, the idea is that we could lead someone into thinking about a certain stimuli by making uh, cues word or. Uh, similar stimuli available, yeah. So they would tend to recall uh, certain stimuli based on existing stimuli, yeah. So this is actually based on a very popular research, yeah, in social psychology that says, um, uh, I think it's ninety six studies by John Bark as well, and John Bark found that a group of people, a group of participants who were exposed to uh, sets of words that, uh, that portrays the theme of, of being old. Yeah, for example, uh, older people or, or uh, dementia, for example, or uh, feeling weak or something like that. And those participants will tend to, uh, would tend to walk, uh, walk, uh, walk slower than uh, so then another set of participants, another group of participants that didn't get the same sets of answers. So in in other words, yeah, in other words, John Bark and and his friends uh, tried to prove their point that we could uh, lead uh, individuals into uh, into thinking or into behaving certain ways by giving them certain information that is available to them. So by exposing a group of participants, uh, certain words that express a theme about being old, it makes them uh, it makes them walk slower than another group who didn't get the same treatment. However, <laughs> yeah, however, this study is extremely controversial. Yeah, some uh, group of researchers tried to replicate the findings and they didn't get any effect. And they didn't get the same result as the John Burke and his friends did. So this is a huge. There is a huge disputation in social psychology uh, in social psychology nowadays. Maybe you still remember our 
uh, discussion in the first uh, in the first video about replica uh, replication crisis, and that's exactly what happens <laughs> in the priming research. And we're trying to figure out whether this is something uh, real or something that is basically doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. So and there is also a very interesting research in uh, involving priming effect. Uh, uh, there is a huge body of research that confirms uh, people who exposed the yeah, individuals who who were exposed by uh, by certain stimuli, stimuli that led them into thinking that the God is great. Yes, it's basically religious priming. When uh, when those people are reminded by the greatness of the God, they tend to be more uh, tend to be more generous. Yeah, they tend to show more pro-social behavior than those uh, than those who doesn't get the same treatment even though uh, there are a large body of research that provide evidence to this effect again there is a huge methodolo methodological disputes and people uh, are now still debating whether the religious priming is real or just a, or just a nonsensical nonsensical uh, conclusion <laughs> yeah so that is the end of the first part of the lecture, and I'm going to continue uh, the lecture by explaining about how we use and organize our memories about a person.